Hi, Billy Goodnick here at Seaside Gardens in Carpinteria, and welcome to Garden Wise, the place where all the cool kids come to learn about sustainable landscaping. I think it was Hamlet who said, to hire a pro or do it yourself. You know, there are a lot of projects that you can do on your own to create a more sustainable garden, but every once in a while we bite off more than we can chew, and we end up asking ourselves, what now? Well, we're gonna help you out of that dilemma by talking with Ashley Farrell and Nate Zacharias about when to hire a pro and when to do it yourself. Hi, if you've been paying attention to the show, you know we're all about reducing your water use and one of the best ways to do that is, of course, to get rid of your lawn. But the question arises, after you've gotten rid of the lawn, what are you gonna do with all that extra space? One thing people like to do is just expand the living area of their home. To help us understand the type of projects that are reasonable for most people to tackle, I'm going to talk with Ashley Farrell. She's a fabulous landscape contractor and uh, just a lot of fun to be around. So the lawn is gone and uh, I find as, as a consultant with people, people are just kind of stuck saying, well, what else do you do? Well, you want to decide what type of space you need. If you have children, you might want to make a space for them to... to to use, you know, that you could set up an area with for bocce ball or hmm. cornhole or ping pong or, you know, uh, other types of, you know, sports. And, you know, you might want to have a vegetable area where you have raised beds. Um, you can also, um, you know, you might have to, a need for outdoor storage, you know, an additional area to store bikes and surfboards and things of, of that nature. The stuff you don't want to look at from the living room. Exactly. What about just, uh, <clears throat> Having family over, having people over. And then over. there's entertaining, yes. You want to create outdoor rooms, spaces where you can bring, you want to draw people out into the garden. So, you know, if you're going to create a patio, maybe you put it out in the back corner of your patio with a fire pit so that you can you enjoy and utilize all the areas of your garden. So thinking about floors, we talked about dining areas and also the place where you just go to chill out. Seems that with a dining table and chairs, the stakes are higher. Uh, you don't want the table tipping around and end up with a beautiful bottle of uh, wine going over on you. So how would somebody think about what's a DIY project in terms of floors? I would say the, um, the outermost patios that are maybe a little more informal or things that you would do yourself, whereas something close to the home, the dining area where you're going to be using it, lots of chairs being pulled in and out, that would be a, a an opportunity to have a professional come in and have something set on concrete or grouted joints so you have a solid surface. Uh, what about uh, edges? I'm looking at some beautiful stucco walls here. Is that something somebody would tackle or if they needed some type of wall, what's something manageable for a homeowner? So there are a lot of prefab um, materials out there, interlocking um, pavers and um, keystone walls that that when, once you set a solid base on below, you can just stack them like a Legos. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the ones that are stacked and set back and you fill exactly. the cells with exactly. gravel. Exactly. Really easy to make as long as you give yourself a proper base. Gotcha. Um, fences, things like that? Fences, they, they make panels cells? now in eight foot lengths, you know, six foot p fences that are eight foot panels. All you got to do is sink the post and attach them and yes, certainly a homeowner so can do something can like that. So if you can dig a hole, pour some concrete and Set your know post. how to work a level. Exactly. It's a little outside of my skill, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, floors, well, ceilings, overhead. How do we create shade? Uh, it sounds like carpentry skills, things like that. There's a lot of uh, opportunities in shade structures, you know, from outdoor arbors to uh, sail shades, which you would call a company for, but to, but to umbrellas. Yeah. Yeah. But then you can just plant a tree. There's nice um, shade trees, you know, umbrella shaped trees. Uh, the Tipawana comes to mind. It's a nice, big, full shade tree that creates a lot of dappled shade. So Mother Nature can give you all the shade you need if you want to plant a few trees. So let's take a little tour through this garden and kind of differentiate between what's doable for most people and where you call the pro. Okay. Um, looking at this beautiful wall, you're sitting on it here. We've got another nice one up here uh, acting as a retaining wall. Uh, yes or no, something somebody could do in their own garden. 
If you're retaining a larger portion of soil, if you've got a very sloped hillside, then you might want to think about having some uh, an engineer come in and, and make a drawing and have it professionally done. Um, let's move on a little bit and talk uh, talk sure. about floors. Actually, before we move on, we're looking at some steps here. Yes. Uh, this does not look like a typical homeowner project. No. These what, were what's going on underneath this? These were poured uh, concrete. We, we poured concrete and then um, set the concrete on top, mortared them in place. Uh, this is a little bit more technical. This takes more refinement. Yes, right. yes. Okay, let's look at a path down here. Tell me what's going on. I'm seeing uh, individual stepping stones with diamondi around them, some beautifully set rocks, uh, gravel in here. You're standing on a, a bridge. Yes. I'm assuming there's no troll underneath. There's no headroom. So um, what's this? Is this doable? This is absolutely doable, and in this uh, situation, this water, this creek actually flows at certain times of the year. There's a lot of water coming down the hill. We created high areas against the house so that the water would be trained away from the house, and it actually has drain uh, drains along the way. There's hard pipe under here, and then the water eventually uh, gets to the street if it f gets full enough. Fabulous. Um, stepping stones. Diamondia is a great way to add some um, green green belt type of a feature with a drought tolerant aspect. Last up, I'd like to look at this patio over here because it's very different than what we have going on here and up above. And I think it just shows some really beautiful craftsmanship that maybe is the next level for people do, uh, on a do-it-yourself type of approach. Sure, sure. Show me, show me. What's your thought process to get these uh, wonderful sort of flowing lines through here? Well, if you have a lot of time, you could probably chip this yourself. But so this is mallet this is, and chisel. It is, it is. And again, if you used some large pieces, you could probably get away with just using some irregular, you know, large pieces set in the gravel. Right, but I love this jigsaw puzzle. It's like San Andreas Fault is gradually moving yeah. the continents <laughs> away. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it seems fairly straightforward. You can... You draw a line with a pencil. Yep, and you use a pencil, you lay one stone next to the other, and you figure out where you need to cut it, and then you just literally um, line your chisel up and hit it with a hammer a few times in a straight line, and you can literally just knock it off. With eye protection. Eye protection, absolutely. Great. And uh, the filler in between, this is what? So this is a... Other than dog tail. <laughs> this is a Mexican pebble. The homeowner couldn't decide on the Mexican pebble and the gray uh, pea gravel, so we kind of did a little blend of, of both of them. So if you're up for the challenge, give something like this a try. So we've talked to Ashley about hardscape, patios, walkways, stairs, that sort of thing. Whatever doesn't have the hardscape on it is dirt and it's open for planting. But before you go out to the nursery, uh, whip out your Visa card and start loading up the car with all these beautiful plants, it's good to understand how a do-it-yourselfer can put the plants in the ground, get them to thrive, and how to care for them afterwards. So I've invited Nate Zacharias from Allscape Design to help us out and learn a little bit more about how to get the plants in the ground, how to make them grow. So um, before you start digging holes, putting things in the ground, you've got to know what plants you're going to use, how many right. you're going to use. Um, what do we think about rather than just impulse buying? Ooh, pretty flowers. Definitely having a plan, whether it's a full design from an architect or a designer uh -huh. or do it yourself. So you're, you're choosing plants with a purpose first. And we're going to use the WaterWise SB website to help you find your plants. You've seen that in some past episodes. Right. Um, so we've got some idea what the planting plan is going to be, thinking about spacing, etc. Now it's time to buy some plants, bring them home, and figure out how to put them in the ground. Yes. Why don't we go uh, look at a little planting area and, and see what we can learn from that. Okay. It is important that when you're planting a plant, whether it's a 1, 5, or 15, that the top of the ball is above grade. I am... We usually do it about an inch to two inches above grade, and then you create a basin around it so it's elevated above, and it doesn't allow for root cro uh, crown rot to happen through moisture. So, so digging the hole where the top of the can's nine, but the root ball is at eight, you're digging a seven inch hole. That's some pretty soil. It is. Big clods in here. Uh, we're not ready to put soil in yet, are we? No. In fact, we have a few amendments that we want to backfill with the soil to make sure that this has a, uh, a good establishment. So let's go over the list of ingredients that are gonna go back in the hole. The main ingredient is gonna be your, your starter amendment. So this goes in, how much? Um, 
I would just go ahead and take up the bottom part of this. Okay. Maybe about a quarter of the bag, just to kind of have it in there. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. The second one that we typically use is a worm casting. Um, that again has a little worm bit poop. Worm poop. Yes. Yeah. You can say that as well. We should have warned you because the kids might be in the room. So, again, a couple handfuls gets mixed in, and then you have your starter fertilizer. There's a lot of products out there. I'd always go organic if you can, um, especially if you're planting amongst perennials and edible type foods. Uh, you know your citrus trees or what have you. So uh, we use a five three one. And another product that we use, I mean, it doesn't really matter either or, is like a sure start. Right. You uh, really don't need much of this. So you sprinkle it on top. So I have probably a cup, three quarters of a cup mixed with, um, what do we have here? A half a cubic foot of material maybe? So mixing it evenly is important. Now do we need, do we need any of the soil that we took out of the hole? Yes. Okay. I definitely want to use more percentage of the, of the soil that's that's been pulled out of the hole. You don't want to create a false environment for plant material. Now, we're gonna go over here because you don't just dump the soil in, there's ways of getting it in. What we're trying to avoid is big air pockets um, within the soil so that the roots might dry out. So let's talk about how to get the soil into the hole. So at this point, we have our, our hole depth and we have our hole width. The plant is placed how we want it, right. facing the right direction. And uh, we're gonna get ready for the proper backfill. The soil we're taking, out of the wheelbarrow at this point. We'll get this out of the way. We'll probably do two scoops. Kind of like raisin bran. And then take that. Some of the outer from the original hole. Ah, okay. Mix it in. Now you do want to press. Correct? Okay, um, we're almost there, right? We are. And our next step? That would be water in. Gotcha. What you want is to make sure you have an even distribution of water and do a deep soak. Run it over there maybe about 10 seconds per plant or so. Let's say we're a couple hours down the road. And give it another douse. And you do have to be a little bit careful too. Certain plants don't like to have foliage watered on it. It's kind of a tricky. I think initially when you're putting plants in the ground, it's okay. Um, but you can start seeing the water seep down a little slower and I think you're good right here. So before we wrap up on this segment, I want to talk a little bit about where's that line between do it yourself and when you might want to call somebody like Allscape or a, a professional to help. What do you think is a reasonable scale for somebody who's just family person, they got their weekend, um, how many plants can you put in the ground in a couple hours or an afternoon? Uh, that's a tough question. It, it depends on the soil, but um, now you're probably getting in 20 to 40 in that average if you're planting them in on your own. Okay. Um, it, it, it's a little difficult continuously to, to put in a landscape in a nice flow um, and kind of spotting everything yourself and creating the spaces for your, you know, yourself. So um, having outside help, Obviously, for the physical part, is great. Um, I would also picture if you're if you're working on a slope, you're working in some kind of conditions that are a little riskier. Working in really heavy soil. Yeah, safety is important. Um, and then when you're swinging a pickaxe, or if you have a, a spade shovel up on a slope, it's not the easiest to to maintain your balance. Um, that's where we would come into play, right? Or another contractor. Also, uh, I would imagine if you go out, you buy all the plants. Let's say you're putting 100 plants in, and you only get 20 of them in the ground. You've got that responsibility of keeping them alive until your next weekend frees up. And, and often, good intentions, plants don't get watered. They uh, they start to lag, and and then you put them in the ground. What happens? Well, first off, they're already stressed. Right. Uh, and then you have to acclimatize from sitting in a can for, let's say, a month, two months, I haven't seen it any further than that. Um, you know, the root bound starts happening. Uh, it's tough to keep them fresh. You know, you have, to, you have to throw a little fertilizer on them every month or so if you're gonna keep them there, but that is one of the big issues about bringing on outside help is to make sure that everything gets in in a timely manner and things aren't pushed back yeah. because you will lose out on plant material for sure. So the lesson here is um, if you're new to all of this, don't bite off more than you can chew. 
Uh, if you need a little bit of help, uh, there's people out there who will help you with digging the holes. There can be some high school kids or college kids with a little background in horticulture who like doing a little bit of the grunt work. That way you can just kind of point and put the backfill in. Uh, so I hope this has been really helpful in helping you understand how to get plants in the ground, what to select, how to purchase your plants. Um, we're wrapping up. Thanks very much. Hey, big thanks to uh, Ashley and Nate for helping us sort out the line between DIY and when you might want to hire a pro. Next up, my buddy Oscar Carmona of Healing Grounds Nursery and Santa Barbara City College. He's going to talk to us about how to work with your gardener to create a sustainable, healthy landscape. Hi, I'm Oscar Carmona. I'm a professor at uh, Santa Barbara City College in the School of uh, Extended Learning. And uh, I teach the Green Gardener Certification Program. And uh, next year, in 2020, we're going to be celebrating our 20th anniversary. What's important to know about the Green Gardener Program is that it was the first of its kind anywhere in the country or really the world uh, in terms of a program that taught uh, sustainable landscaping techniques. And uh, the reason why the program came about was because there was a tremendous problem with people over fertilizing and over watering their lawns in particular. And the pollution was going all the way out to the ocean and creating a, a great problem. And so uh, this is a unique program because it is a collaboration between uh, public agencies and uh, City College. And um, it's a, a wonderful collaboration that uh, provides um, just a, a dynamic support for learning about these uh, important topics, uh, both for the landscaper as well as for the homeowner. Um, I want to give a shout out to Phil Boys and to um, Darcy Aston and Allison Jordan, who were really uh, instrumental in putting all this information together and conceiving of the program. Um, they were um, important people in the development and also in the uh, evolution of this program. The Green Gardener program uh, specifically uh, uh, seeks to uh, create opportunities for people to see ways that they can solve problems in the landscape um, without the use of pesticides or uh, toxic chemicals, as well as, and now especially because of the drought, uh, how to manage water appropriately. And then when we understand that the uh, proper management of these um, uh, techniques and, and inputs that we have in the landscape also support the health of the plant, um, we then can uh, start to enjoy a healthy landscape uh, without a lot of uh, toxic inputs that we all know uh, affect uh, not only uh, the well-being of our plants, but especially children and pets and uh, adults. One of the things that we uh, promote with um, landscapers and homeowners alike is to uh, communicate well about what is happening in the landscape that would be the landscaper to the homeowner or um, also the homeowner with previous knowledge of what's going on in the landscape to the gardener. So communication is, is, is central to all of this um, education that we offer. And uh, to that end, uh, the city uh, provides uh, pamphlets that assist uh, the homeowner and the lands landscaper to be able to discuss key, key issues that, um, that are important to, to communicate. Um, the, there are maybe five or six topics that are covered in the pamphlet. And um, the first being fundamentally that uh, a healthy plant is a, a plant that requires uh, little support in terms of um, pesticides to, to fight off pests and diseases. So the, a healthy plant is, is the best way to go. And this is the backbone of our program. Another area is that it is important to understand that we need to build soil fertility uh, and also to provide protection for cons conserving water when we use uh, compost and mulch. 
Uh, we're fortunate that we have a, a, a municipality that offers a really good quality free mulch, pretty much, or at a very low cost. So um, these issues or these, these topics are communicated either by the homeowner or the landscaper who is educating the homeowner about uh, the values of building soil fertility as a, fun, a foundation for healthy plants. We also talk about uh, proper uh, irrigation management, which means not just how much water you use, but making sure your irrigation systems function properly, that we are uh, managing the uh, controllers um, regularly, that could be monthly based on uh, weather changes, to properly uh, and efficiently um, provide the water that's needed or no water in times of rain. Um, and, th and this is important. And, and our program is not just for landscapers. We also invite uh, homeowners to come in. It's a two-way conversation, really. Um, and uh, we need to, we need to uh, raise the bar as far as the information that we share with each other and that we're looking uh, particularly to landscapers to become more than what we call the mow, blow, and go type, which is the base, right? That's the bottom line or the bottom uh, minimal service. And we're, we're teaching the uh, landscapers that, that they need to elevate their game to provide these other important aspects of what we call sustainable landscaping. Um, and not only because uh, uh, the homeowners are asking for that um, now more than ever, but also I think our community as a whole is demanding that sort of um, quality of attention and uh, there are so many opportunities in this community to see wonderful examples of that, be it at the Botanic Garden or any of the water agencies in town. Um, and so uh, it's, uh, it's with great pleasure that I continue to be part of this program. I have been lucky to be part of it since 2000. And I wanna say that uh, we will be adding and we continue to add more classes to our, our arsenal of what we're offering the public next year we'll be having, uh, this will be the second year that we're offering an advanced uh, Green Gardener program. We have a recertification class that's coming online. And then in a couple of years, we'll be adding even uh, uh, another, uh, a new class, which is small scale food production, uh, which is uh, an emerging uh, important topic as well. This is Oscar Carmona for Santa Barbara City College and uh, also for Healing Grounds Nursery, which is uh, my business that I do um, consulting with. Um, wishing you happy gardening. Hey, a big thank you to Oscar. I told you he'd have some great advice. And congratulations to all the Green Gardener Program graduates over the past 20 years. They've been doing a great job for our community. Next up, more advice on do-it-yourself versus hiring a pro. Kathy Perret, our irrigation specialist, is going to show us how to do some simple irrigation repairs to help keep your irrigation system efficient and also save you some money. Hi, I'm Kathy Perret with the City of Santa Barbara's Water Conservation Program. Let's talk irrigation. More specifically, what are some easy repairs that the homeowner can do to keep their sprinklers running more efficiently? Some of them, especially with drip systems, are really simple. But you do have to think about it. Just a moment. Is this something that I'm comfortable doing? Do I want to hire someone else? Because I don't, I don't like to do get my hands dirty. It is irrigation you're gonna get wet. So drip systems are super simple to do minor repairs. Why don't you come with me? We're here at one of our local irrigation stores, Aquaflow, and it has all the parts and the information, and the resources that those of us are working on our systems can use. Good morning, how Hello. are you? Good morning. I'm working on this drip repair project. Can you point me in the direction of the materials I need? Absolutely, it's gonna be an aisle two on your right. Thank you. We take our sprinklers for granted. They run when we're not around or in the middle of the night. There are clues when you look around your yard. Patches that are yellow, plants that are dying. Are you growing moss on the sidewalk? Are the windows of your car or house being sprayed and leaving that trail of white water stain? Is there water in the curb? Take a walk about and look for the signs of the problems. They may be obvious, such as a puddle around a sprinkler head, a valve box full of water, or maybe a cut or a chewed drip line. Let me give you a couple bits of advice when you're working with an irrigation system. 
you're going to want to, one, you've got to turn it on. So many of the different leaks are happening only when the water system is pressurized. If you're working on a drip line, I would strongly advise you use these little flags. They come in a variety of lovely colors. Yellow, green, you want something bright that you're going to see and if you don't get to the repair right away, it'll stand out when you walk out to your car in the morning and you'll realize, oh, I still have that project to do this weekend. What happens a lot of times is that an irrigation, the drip irrigation tubes will lose an emitter, the water will be squirting out, and you'll think to yourself, oh yeah, I'll remember, it's right by that rock. I'll come back and put a goof plug in there. You turn it off, you go back, and there's a lot of rocks. Can't quite remember where it is. So use the flags. That's number one. If you understand your system, you'll be able to take it apart and put it back together. If you look at something and it, you know, it looks too complicated, that's what the professionals are for. That might be the time that you hire a professional to come in and work with you. But there are some simple, easy repairs. And let's go over to the aisle with all the different parts. And I want to show you what each of those parts does and give you an example of what you can do at home to make an easy repair. Let's go over a few do-it-yourself um, drip repair scenarios here. I'm going to show you the most common one. Maybe you have a, a cut in your drip pipe. Obviously, this is on the ground. Let me show you how to use a connector to fix it. What you're going to have to do is actually separate that. Just using a pair of pruning shears will work just fine. You just want a nice straight cut. And then you're going to use what's called a connector. This is a connector. You're going to put this in between where the broken piece, the cut piece was. Got to give it a little zigzag back and forth motion. Not as easy. Got one side. And at the other side, boom, good as new. The next scenario, which is really common, is you have a drip emitters that have popped out of the tube. It happens sometimes if the pressure is too high, happens if you trip over it. Uh, they do come out occasionally. You can put them back in and you can replace them. So let's take a look at this. This is the little hole where a drip emitter normally would be in. So say you have a spaghetti tube with a connector and it popped out. It's laying there. You've got water shooting 15 feet up in the air. You've got a geyser. It's hitting your window. You can fix this one super easy too. Take that emitter that's right next to it, pop it back in the hole. Fixed. Super easy. You can do it. The next one, I'm going to kind of go on with the emitter thing a little bit. These are micro sprays. And you might notice on the top of this one, it's totally flat. So what's happening is the water's not being spread out anymore. It's just shooting straight up in the air. They're plastic. They get old. They need to be replaced. So the best way to do this is you unscrew the top of this. And I find that if I have a little, a little wrench, that's easy. And you just unscrew, take this off. And then you come here to the irrigation store and they have a large variety of different styles of micro sprays. I'm replacing a blue one that was a half circle. So I'm gonna come over, I'm gonna pick a blue one that's a 180, and then when I take it home, I'm just gonna screw it right back in the top of this riser, point the arrow so it's pushing the water on the plants, it's done. This is another one, you can do it. And then last but not least, the area where there's no plants living there anymore and you walk out and you're still watering the dirt, you can put what's called a goof plug. I know it's an official name, very professional, super helpful. I would advise having that in your little first aid kit for your irrigation at home all the time. Let me show you how those work. I have a little kit here that I keep some extra parts in so that if something's broken, I'm always set. These are goof plugs. And what you're gonna do for a goof plug, say this was watering and sprinkling and it's just dirt, and now I'm growing weeds. You're gonna remove this. We just put it in, but we're gonna take it out. Then you're gonna remove off of this little tree, one goof plug. I usually, cause I usually will find that I need once again to use a, a little wrench so that I can hold on to this. Here's the hole. Here's the goof plug. You pop it in. 
You don't have sprinkler water that comes out of this hole anymore. Now you don't have to pick weeds. You can do this one too. Goof plugs, they're your friend. So a little different, we're gonna move to pop-up sprinklers. If you have water in the curb, and it seems like the water is hitting the soil, and it's just not soaking in. We have that lovely clay soil. You, as a homeowner, can do a really easy adjustment and make your sprinkler more efficient. You can pop up your sprinkler, gotta hold on to it, undo this existing nozzle, and there are low precipitation rate rotating nozzles that you just retrofit. You put it in the same hole the old one came out, screw it down, pop, you're done. Are you a little bit more adventurous? Are you a down and dirty kind of do-it-yourselfer? Well, if you don't mind digging in the dirt, there are some repairs that you can do. And I wouldn't say it's super easy, but it's well within the expertise of a homeowner. So say you've got a sprinkler, it's down in the soil. It's gurgling water out. Dig it out. Most times, it's this little riser that breaks. It gets stepped on, a car goes on it. You just need to unscrew it from the riser. Come to your favorite irrigation store. They have an adjustable cutoff riser. What you do with this is you screw it back into your sprinkler on the base here. I would usually advise putting some Teflon tape just to be sure you don't get a leak. And then depending on how deep the sprinkler needs to be, if you only need two inches, you cut it off here. If you need a full four inches of riser from your main water supply, you leave it long, screw this into the PVC pipe, turn it on and make sure it's not leaking, and then bury it back in the dirt again. Kathy's gonna be back in a second right after this break. Now is the best time of year to plant. For spring color, plants need to establish roots in winter. Upgrade your landscape to a beautiful, low-maintenance, water-wise garden. And make mowing a thing of the past. Put down your roots. Find garden inspiration at waterwisesb.org. It's 4 a.m. Do you know what your sprinklers are doing? broken drip emitter. Gurgling spray head. Missing drip emitter. Dog. Micro sprayer overspray. Broken pipe. Runoff. Check your sprinklers for leaks and repair. Let's save together. It's so much fun getting lost at Seaside Gardens. Fabulous place, come down and visit. But back to the show. Kathy Pere is gonna to talk to us about irrigation controllers. They can be a little bit mysterious, which one to use when. Kathy's gonna clear all that up. I'm here with Trevor from Aquaflow, and he's one of the professionals that we can use as a local resource. So one of the questions I have is, you know, we've gone over a lot of do-it-yourself sort of things, but I'm sure there's projects that people come in and it, it's just a little too involved. What kind of things should maybe a homeowner look to get a professional to help them with? Mm, most commonly, a lot of the times, a lot of problems you see is like irrigation controller, like, like programming and stuff, okay. like it's not coming on when it's supposed to, or maybe adjusting the times. Um, sometimes doing that kind of wiring and you know electrical can be kind of confusing. So these, um, these actually are wired into an electrical mm -hmm. system? They're wired then. into, yeah, an electrical system. So okay. sometimes you know, reinstalling them might not be as simple as just plugging it in. You might have to do a little bit of wiring. Okay. Um, sometimes maybe a professional electrician might be a little bit easier, a landscape professional. Okay. And so if they have a question on what kind of a controller, they can come in and ask you? Definitely. Um, okay. Photos that's are a huge help. If, 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 you know, photos of what you have or problems are a big help. Okay. 
How, how about if something's leaking? You know, someone thinks, you know, they're really good at fixing things, but maybe they shouldn't make more of a mess? Mm, sometimes a lot of the things are pretty easy to fix. Um, you know, a lot of the YouTube videos and, you know, the manufacturers put out actually tell you how to do the processes yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's something, you know, you can always watch a video. If it's something too involved, you can always call a professional or give us a call and we can recommend somebody or let so, you know what you're looking at. I had a valve box, it's full of water. Would you say that maybe trying to tackle a valve replacement would be something that I'd want to bring in somebody with a little bit more knowledge? Mm, definitely, if you, if you haven't done it before, or you don't feel confident with it, I definitely would. Okay. Um, you know, things can get out of hand pretty quick when you have to cut pipe or, you know, or kind of do some wiring. So how about backflows? Backflows are a big com common thing too. Um, people see like them leaking out of the bottom or dripping. So if it's just dripping, I should have somebody come look at it. Then? Definitely with a backflow. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Backflows are are generally supposed to be serviced every year, tested every year. Um, well, that's good to know. So a lot of the times they'll be leaking or dripping. It, it you know you can repair it yourself, but it's usually best just to have a professional who's certified. So we, I've been in here. Say I'm a homeowner and I've got everything up and running, and the sprinklers keep popping off of my drip line. Is there a way that you can reduce the pressure other than just those little pressure regulators? Should a system have a pressure regulator on it or a reducer? It should. Most, most drip systems should be regulated to at least 30 PSI or less. Oh, okay. um, depending on, you know, depending on you know, what kind of sprays you have and what kind of system you have. Um, but you definitely want to have some sort of regulator to keep the pressure, you know, from being too high and causing stuff like that. You know, mitters popping out or sprinkler heads popping out or, you know, spraying everywhere. <sighs> That's good to know. I am so glad you guys are here. I have oh, to yeah. say, when I was first learning to do irrigation, mm -hmm. I came out, I'd bring my plans and say, this is where I'm trying to go. Mm -hmm. And the staff actually helped me figure out which parts did I need? Mm -hmm. How could I connect this up to my hose bib? Could I turn it on manually? Did mm -hmm. I need a controller? Could I use it off of a hose timer? It was awesome. Trevor, Definitely. having you guys here is a great local resource. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us really? today. About no problem. This. We're here for hey. uh, we're here for everyone. That's great. So whether you're a do-it-yourselfer or you're looking to hire a professional, our local irrigation stores are a great resource. If you want to find out more information and watch videos on how to do these repairs yourself, visit us at WaterWiseSB.org. Thank you, Kathy. Those were some great tips. Now for my favorite part of the show, I'm gonna be poking around Seaside Garden, having a little bit of fun with what I think is one of the most important parts of planting design. I'm gonna be looking for killer plant combos. Stay tuned. Everyone enjoys a good combo. Peanut butter and jelly, spaghetti and meatballs, burger and fries, but today we're talking about plant combos. I'm at beautiful Seaside Gardens in Carpinteria and we're going to show you a few ideas about how to create these exclamation marks or these high points in your garden where two plants, three plants are having this great conversation together. The two basic ideas in any composition are harmony, things that look like they fit together, and contrast, things that don't go together or have, have differences in terms of how they look. So we're going to look at how that applies to plants, contrasting elements and harmonizing elements. So let's start with a subtle example here. I've got two plants, very tropical looking plants, and what they have in common, what's harmonious about them, is they both have leaves that generate from the center and come out like blades of grass, although thicker than a real grass. This one is thin, uh, it's a darker green foliage, and this one is fatter, sort of like a pineapple, and it's got a wide, more yellow-green leaf. So what I've got going on here is two plants that look like they belong together uh, harmoniously because of the, their structure, but what creates the contrast and makes them differentiate from each other is the width of the leaf and the color of the foliage. So that's one place to start. Uh, with just subtle characteristics between plants. So here's a variation on that. We use the same plant that had a subtle combination with its neighbor, and here we bring in something with really strong contrast, this giant split leaf philodendron. So it's still an interesting combination, but it's working at the farthest ends of the spectrum. Dark green, big broad leaf, this is fine, a little more of kind of a gray green. So you can take one plant and build off of it in either direction. 
So let's talk about flower combinations. I have two beautiful forms of sage here. This is Salvia Waverly. You see it in a lot of gardens and the ubiquitous Mexican sage with the dark purple flowers in here. Because they're both sages, also known as salvia, they have the same flower structure. It's a long wisp with flowers uh, coming up along the, the sides of the twigs and we see that in both. So the form is the same. They come to a, a slight point. What's different about them? A number of things. The texture. This is much finer, uh, smaller flowers. These are a little more coarse. These have a slight blush of lavender to them. These are an intense purple. So in terms of a pairing or a killer combo, I like these because they have so much in common and they're just subtly different from each other. Here's another way to create a combo. We find something the plants have strongly in common, in this case the purple flowers on the sage and the dark purple flowers on the princess flower, but everything else about them is different. We've got the silvery leaves, big broad leaves, completely different shaped flower on the uh, Tibuchina, that's its uh, botanical name, and a completely different form on the uh, sage. So that's all well and good when we're looking at plants in the garden, but how do you create your own combos and bring them home? Depends on what you're looking for. Let's say there's a small space in the garden where you just want to have some, some nice floral color. What about this idea? I've got lavender and fleabane, and what's going on here is I've got this sort of subtle pinkish uh, lavender color that plays really nicely together, but look at the texture of the plants. They're both very different. The position of the plant, this is very upright, this is broad and spreading, this is fine texture, this is a little denser. These are the sort of things you look for as a starting point, and we work with harmony, color, or contrast, which is all the other form and foliage of the plant. What about background plants where we want to create a little bit of pop? One of my favorite plants these days is acacia, Itiophila, don't try spelling that at home, but just look at what's going on here. Soft, wispy, kind of soft, ghostly, silvery gray. What if I pair it with this Grevillea? It's got an amazing flower, this kind of uh, peachy color, and the foliage is more divided. It's a little bit of a chunkier plant, but they both have a strong, upright sort of position. Makes a great combination. See you in a minute. Okay, here's a fun one. We're working with yellow but it's not all about flower color. I've got this salvia, uh, another form of sage with these beautiful sort of chartreuse yellow flowers, and notice how the foliage is even a little bit on the yellow side uh, of green. Strong, upright form. What if we pair it with just yellow foliage? This is a form of breath of heaven, and the golden yellow uh, gives us a really nice play on yellow. So we intensify the amount of yellow that's in the garden, but we do it with a combination that creates a tremendous amount of contrast. Subtle contrast, two different forms of flax. Now what I would not do with these plants is just go A, B, A, B. A light one, a dark one, a light one, a dark one. I would plant four or five or six of the darker one and intersperse maybe a smaller percentage of the lighter colored one, or you can reverse that proportion and have one dominate and the other one be the lesser. Um, what we've got here, of course, is the harmony of the plant having the same form and the contrast is subtle. What if, though, we bring in another plant in the same sort of color group. This is a form of euphorbia, and we can drop that out and stay with these dark sort of somber tones, but we've got completely different forms. So these are all ideas on how to create pairings of plants that have a, a reason for them. I got one more for you. You know, we can do the same idea in the vegetable garden. There's no reason your vegetables just have to be lined up where they grow. You can create beautiful combinations. What about using a red leaf lettuce with a beautiful crispy parsley? Um, put them in your salad, put them in your garden, however you want to go. So this is my lesson on killer combos. Uh, it's a way to approach plant purchases so that you're not just randomly saying, ooh, shiny, you're coming home with me. We're trying to create a reason for pairing plants. And once you've got two plants that are working together, think about how that leads to the other plants that surround them. I'm at Seaside Garden. Hope you enjoyed this. Thanks. Well, that does it for this episode. Thanks for staying with us because I think it shows that you care about creating a water-wise, beautiful, responsible garden, and that's great for the whole community. I'm your host, Billy Goodnick. Thanks for watching and stay water-wise, Santa Barbara County.